Hey everyone, welcome back to the greenhouse. Uh, I know it's been a little while since I've done a video on the plants here. Uh, I've been busy over the summer traveling to different areas filming wildlife. If you'd like to see those, certainly check out the uh, channel on here, uh, Wildlife Adventures or the uh, Reptiles uh, sections. Lots of cool animals that we've seen over the summer, but now that winter's come in, that sort of activity is kind of dying down, and I am back here in the greenhouses, busying myself more and more with the plants again. And today, I thought I'd uh, talk a little bit about uh, one of the rather iconic groups of carnivores that people often encounter as kind of a somewhat challenging but uh, common uh, first plant that you might grow, and that is one of the Sisters of Queensland sundews. So uh, there used to be only three species uh, known. There has recently been described a fourth, however, uh, in that group. And those are Drosera adelaide, Drosera prolifera, Drosera schizandra, and then the newest is Drosera bubagugin, which is named after uh, an aboriginal term in order to honor the people of the land where it actually grows, a uh, reserve that is overseen by the uh, native peoples of Australia. Now these species are all uh, similar in some ways in that they are rather unique in the sundews being rainforest growing plants. Uh, they live in separate mountain ranges on the uh, Cape York Peninsula or uh, Eastern Queensland area of Australia, places with uh, cool uh, tropical rainforests that are developing there. Uh, they do experience a bit of uh, seasonality, uh, a slightly drier summer and then a wetter uh, winter quote-unquote season, but overall it is a relatively wet and cool and shady environment year-round. And so these guys are kind of unique in having adapted to uh, that sort of environment. Now the one that people are probably going to encounter first is Drosera adelaide, the lance leaf sundew. This is one of the uh, few species that has managed to make it into uh, sales by like big box stores, uh, grocery stores. This is one of the plants you'll see in those little death cubes that they sell. Uh, this is also potentially one of the largest species in the group. I received this particular form here labeled as giant, although I am still skeptical about uh, the idea that any of these uh, forms in cultivation are truly larger than one or the other. Uh, because the size and the color of these guys is really strongly controlled by the environmental conditions. Uh, I have had plants of this form grow out to where each leaf is well over 7 inches long, so the plant itself is over 14, 15 inches across, and they could potentially get bigger. But at the same time, as you can see, none of these guys are that size right now. Most of them are between 3 and about 5 inches in diameter because they have kind of settled into a groove. They're kind of crowding each other out, even though there's space for them to spread. They like to kind of grow along the edges of this pot. And so they also grow under relatively strong lighting, which is what gives them that nice kind of reddish hue here. So uh, where they get the name Lance Leaf Sundew is probably obvious. They have these very long uh, tapered or lance-shaped leaves. And uh, again, in lower lighting, uh, these guys tend to grow larger and they get greener. You increase the lighting and they turn much redder like this. They start out, uh, these guys actually propagate kind of uniquely uh, via their root systems. They will actually send out the roots almost like runners underground. And so all along those roots you get little buds that will pop up. And when these guys start growing, if we look very closely, we can see in here, and I'll show uh, larger on the screen, uh, they start off with relatively rounded leaves. And I'll get to why that's kind of interesting in a little while here. But as they grow up, that leaf shape changes. The bigger it gets, the more elongate and pointed the leaf shape gets. These guys live fairly uh, far north on the peninsula. And they grow also in some of the sunniest environments of any of these species. So they will be found on bare cliff faces sometimes, as well as uh, closer to creeks and underneath uh, shadier environments. So they are a very adaptable species. They tolerate higher light and higher temperatures. Also can tolerate a little bit lower humidity than the other guys. So uh, that is why you often see them in uh, cultivation, just 
in the big box stores and stuff and why a lot of people might encounter this as one of their first carnivorous plants that they grow. The next species that people will often encounter, and it's found, I believe, a little bit further south and in slightly shadier environments, is Drosera prolifera, sometimes called the hen and chick sundew. Now, again, these are all very, very closely related plants, but you can see this is a completely different looking plant altogether. It doesn't have those long lance-shaped lamina. Instead, it's got these very long petioles and then this little kidney bean-shaped lamina at the end. And again, just like Adelaide, these guys can change shape and color a little bit based on how much light they uh, endure. These guys tend to like it a little shadier, a little cooler, but they can also tolerate fairly bright conditions given that they have a cool uh, and relatively humid environment. So that's why these guys are a little bit redder as well, because they grow in the, under the same light that I keep the uh, lance uh, leaf sundews. Now, why these guys are called hen and chick sundews is because unlike Adelaide, they don't reproduce via their roots, but rather they send out these long scrambling flower stalks. And of course, like any flowering plant, along that stalk you have these little tiny flowers. Uh, Adelaide has these beautiful, fairly large, kind of star-shaped flowers that can be red or whitish, kind of depending on the environment. Again, these guys have smaller flowers, very, very tiny. And while I don't have any active on here, I'll show in the video here a close-up of one of these flowers. They're very small, have kind of rounded petals, this rich, like maroon pinkish color. And right at the end of that uh, flower stalk, right at the tip there, there will be a little bud once the flower stalk is done growing that bud will uh, reach down and touch the soil somewhere and from that tip it will produce a new uh, plantlet that roots and grows. And so by that way these guys can stretch out through their environment and colonize areas further away from the mother plant. So the hen in the middle reaching out and producing the little chicks, kind of like some of the other hen and chicks plants people might be familiar with that are usually uh, succulents. They grow in kind of a similar manner. And then the uh, newly described species, Drosera bubagujin, is not in cultivation yet, but it is very, very similar looking to the uh, rarest in cultivation, the hardest to grow species, and that is Drosera schizandra. Now, these guys are fairly small because uh, I, like a lot of people, tend to struggle a little bit with these guys, but um, they retain this general shape as they grow up. They are this lovely... Uh, broad-leafed plant. They grow as a flat rosette against the ground, producing these large flat leaves with relatively small tentacles too. Um, and these guys are the shade lovers. They love it cool, they love it humid, they love it relatively dim. And so in dim light that's when they'll get the biggest leaves as well. And they also like growing in slightly different soils as well. They tend to grow in these moss pads in the rainforest and so they really do well in uh, bundles of live sphagnum moss like this. Now these guys in the wild can reach almost 14-15 uh, inches across, similar in size almost to Adelaide but with broader leaves, maybe slightly smaller in diameter but in terms of overall uh, size of the plant, uh, leaf area as well, these might actually be the largest species. And um, they have these tiny tentacles. They capture only really small gnats in the wild generally. But interestingly enough, on the mountain where they live, it's Mount Bartle Frere in uh, northeast Australia, they often don't get to actually uh, process the animals they capture. They capture these little gnats, but the ants in the environment often come in and steal those gnats off of the leaves. So it's suspected that these large broad leaves and the shrinking tentacle size is an adaptation to these may slowly be heading away from a carnivorous aspect and growing more as simply a uh, ground cover rainforest plant that has no real special adaptations for carnivory. So it could be we are right in the middle of seeing uh, an evolutionary change in these plants going from uh, a sun-loving uh, carnivore growing a nutrient uh, nutrient low environments to a shade dwelling plant that no longer is able to support carnivory. So 
These are, those are the three species that are in cultivation, and again, the fourth is not yet in cultivation. It may never be, we'll see, because in order to collect it, they need to gain permission from the Aborigines who oversee the land where the plant grows. And due to it growing in that environment, and most of these guys live in certain areas where they are protected in national parks, so they're all relatively secure in the wild, so we don't have to worry about that. Uh, but it does make it hard to collect things for uh, horticultural purposes. So you have to go through very special channels, get the right permits, and permission uh, specifically from the Aboriginal tribes in order to collect these plants now. So that helps protect them in the wild. Now, those are the three species that are in cultivation, but uh, a few years ago, somebody actually managed to cross two of those species and create a fourth variety that we now have in cultivation. And this might actually look somewhat similar to what uh, Bubagujan looks like in some cases. Now, because this is a hybrid, different clones have slightly different looks, so what, what mine looks like may not be exactly the same as all the other ones that you might see out there, but this is what we refer now to as Drosera andromeda. This is Drosera schizandra cross prolifera. And so this is a plant that has very intermediate characteristics between the two. It has these broad, uh, flat leaves like schizandra, but they tend to grow slightly uh, semi-erect. As you can see here, these leaves are kind of sticking up off the soil, which is not like schizandra at all, but more like Drosera prolifera. And they have just a little bit of a pedial. Other forms of this look a lot like Drosera prolifera, but with just massive oversized lamina. And so this has proven to be a fairly easy plant to grow as well, much easier than Schizandra. So it's often a way that people can grow something that looks like Schizandra, but without the difficulty of getting the environmental conditions just right for that plant. And much like uh, Prolifera, we can see down here, it's got this uh, old flower stalk that has grown out here. And at the end of that stalk, it produced a plantlet and that's starting to grow out new. This one has a new stalk that is coming up right here. It also has flowers that are kind of intermediate between the two as well. Uh, Prolifera probably has the smallest flowers of all these species. Adelaide has the large star-shaped flowers. Schizandra also has uh, moderately sized. Granted, all of these compared to the size of the plant, the flowers are tiny. But for uh, what these plants have, Schizandra has slightly larger flowers and a beautiful kind of reddish color. And the name Schizandra actually comes from the split shape of the uh, styles of the stigma in the flower. Some people thought it was because when they get big, the tips of the leaves on Schizandra actually develop kind of a, an indent, so it looks like it's bifurcating. But the name actually came from those tiny little flowers. So these guys, again, they look pretty similar to Schizandra, so a lot of people like to grow them uh, as a way to kind of get around that difficulty that Schizandra has. But all of these plants have fairly similar growing requirements. Uh, they like relatively loose, moderately moist, but not wet soils. And again, cool, somewhat shaded conditions. Now, there are ways you can kind of get around one uh, of those requirements or another if you moderate the other conditions that they require. And what I've found is a lot of people will talk about how these plants need really shady conditions overall. I have often found that is not actually the case. So like these guys, uh, Sch uh, Andromeda used to grow right underneath some of the brighter artificial lights that I have, and Adelaide and Prolifera actually grew directly uh, in sunlight during certain times of the year. When uh, During winter when the sun would come straight through the window, these guys would get hit directly with that and turn this brilliant reddish color. So they can take really high amounts of light at times, provided you get their other requirements correct. Because with these guys, if you don't get just the right conditions correct, they will collapse on you and look really terrible or just die off completely. So again, a relatively loose soil. I do grow them in a mostly peat and perlite based soil, but I keep that a very loose in the pot very light and I often do mix in strands of sphagnum throughout to kind of help open up that soil. So loose, moderately moist, they don't really like to sit in water because that can make them rot as well. And um, a lot of people will grow them in pure sphagnum moss or a sphagnum perlite mix. That often works for a lot of people so that's a good soil mix to try. Um, 
the conditions that I have found they need the most though are related to temperatures and humidity. So most tropical sundews that people are familiar with are going to be things like Drosera spatulata, uh, Drosera lysiae, the indica complex, maybe the Pediolera sundews, they like it hot. These guys do not. So in order to grow these well, what you want to do is keep them cool. Keep them humid, but keep air circulating around them. So humidity should be probably 70, 80 percent plus. A uh, small fan in the environment can help keep air moving through so that they don't develop mold. And keep temperatures below 80 degrees Fahrenheit. In fact, if you can get it below uh, like 70, 65 degrees Fahrenheit, in fact, they can often do really well. If there is a cool down at night, they also do well with that. So if you can get that right, keep them cool and keep them humid. Most of these guys can actually tolerate a lot higher light than what is usually recommended. But if you can't keep them cool, keeping them shaded is important. Okay, keep them uh, under a dimmer light, maybe in the back corner of the greenhouse so they don't get overloaded with uh, energy. Because that's basically what's happening is you are, if they're too warm and they're too sunny, basically their photosynthetic apparatus is going haywire and they basically burn themselves out. And then once you get them growing well, they kind of propagate on their own for you. Again, uh, Schizandra and Adelaide, they both propagate through the roots and Prolifera will send out their flower stalks. Uh, it seems that Andromeda is more like Prolifera in that it also relies on those flower stalks. But again, get the conditions right and they will go wild for you. They will carpet whatever container you put them in. So. That is all that I have for these guys right now. Uh, if there's something that I have missed uh, or if there's questions that you have, be sure to leave in a comment below underneath the video. If you'd like to learn more, I do have files for all these guys up on the website in the database. Go to carltoncarnivores.com and you'll see uh, the banner at the top with all of the major headlines uh, with for the sale plants, uh, for contact. There's the database and the blog up there. There's information for these guys in the database. Um, if you'd like to help support production of educational videos like this or the blogs that I write, consider joining as a patron at patreon.com slash hcarlton. Uh, members there do get exclusive benefits back, such as early access to the videos here. There's merchandise and more. Or you can uh, donate at coffee. I have merchandise also at a Teespring shop that I have. And, of course, plants for sale at carltoncarnivores.com. The links for all those will be down in, below the video in the description, as well as the link to the master link tree uh, button where you can find all the links to the various channels and social media and such. And, of course, uh, if you can't support financially, simply watching these videos, watching them all the way through, giving a subscribe, a like, sharing the videos so that others, other people see it. Attention to these videos really does help me a lot. We are getting really close to being able to actually start monetizing the channel so that simply the videos themselves will help pay for themselves. And I can do more of them. I can go on more trips to bring you more interesting facts in animals and plants and such. Uh, but if you'd like to see more photos, videos, little clips and such, I'm always posting on social media. Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at Carlton Carnivores. But until next time, I'm Hawk and Carlton, and this is Carlton Carnivores. <laughs>